Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third and final session in the University of Florida Library Spaces workshop series. I am Sue Boffman from the Association of Research Libraries and very pleased to welcome everyone this morning. Whether you've joined us for one or, or both of the first two sessions or just joined us today, we have benefited from learning about the University of Florida team's Library Spaces Research Project. During the last session and just now, uh, several of you have mentioned how you could use what you're learning to take back to your library. I want to acknowledge that the workshop <clears throat> are brought to you under the auspices of the Research Library Impact Framework Initiative. And I'm also pleased to note that funds from our IMLS grant have supported this series. <clears throat> Excuse me. We will record today's session and we will share all of the recordings next week. So finally, I want to add a special thanks to the University of Florida team, Laura Spears, Val Minson, Meg Portillo, Jason Manili, and Adrian Del Monte, who I just noticed is joining us um, from the Philippines. <laughs> for their contributions oh. <laughs> to this workshop series and the RLIF initiative. So thank you again for joining us and I look forward to today's workshop. So with that, let me turn the podium over to you, Val. Thank you, Sue. Uh, so let me just say, Adrian, thank you for coming. It's the middle of your night and we are so <laughs> glad that you're here and, and appreciate your, um, uh, your attending. Um, so we're our team is thrilled to be uh, hosting this last session in our series. Our first two sessions covered the methodology of our four-part study, and then our second session uh, explored ways to partner with interior design students, and, and Jason Manili uh, presented at that session. Today, we're going to, you can go to the next slide. Today, we're gonna to chat about how to take a research question. So one that we come at with hidden assumptions, you know, ideas about how our space should be designed. Um, and we're gonna develop a plan of attack or a, a plan of action, and then develop from that action an effective model. So we're gonna also uh, get a, go into a bit more detail about our creativity index instrument and our findings. Um, and then we're gonna close out with the benefits on the library side, um, and the benefits on the design construction and planning side, which is where Meg's from, um, on collaborative partnerships, just sort of as a, a, a round, uh, sort of a, a closing of the loop, because ultimately I think that partnership has helped us, um, has, has been the foundation of, uh, of our work and, and the results of, of, of our renovation, which I might add, um, they, I just got a text that said, we are breaking ground this morning on our fourth and fifth floor renovations, which have been totally driven by this research. And I have to, in the afternoon, move <laughs> carols with my facilities people because it was, it's spur of the moment. Anyways, okay. So the next three slides, these slides are just a visual reminder of where we left off. So Jason had shared uh, in that last presentation, um, that last workshop, had, had, had shared the student work, right? And this is sort of how students uh, see the library space and, and what they had recommended for renovations. Um, and so we think that's a really important stepping off uh, point to our, what I call beating a dead horse, which is we are gonna share with you our <laughs> in, this third, in this third series, um, uh, the, our project in its full glory um, and the next slide, which is all about our research question, right? Um, that's what we start with. How do we take this question um, and then and make it into a scalable model? How do library spaces facilitate innovative research, creative thinking, and problem solving? And I will tell you that this project went a completely different direction than I had expected it to when we first applied uh, for that, for the ARL research library framework. Um, and so I think I, I'm really proud of, of where it's gone. And I'm going to hand this off to Meg. Absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, Val, for that nice uh, setup. So again, uh, how do we go from the research uh, question, you know, into action and then um, potentially 
how uh, G, what meaning does that have for for you who are interested in reimagining and maybe moving into uh, renovating and developing your own spaces? So, you know, essentially we went through this um, model uh, and our research model, again, all of our lives um, to various degrees were impacted by living through and we're still within this pandemic uh, period. And, and there was impact on this process, but essentially our launch point was um, developing the idea and, and there, as with any construct, any complex construct, there are many ways of uh, defining and operationalizing the construct. And very early on, we knew we wanted more of a holistic approach to creativity that not only recognized those students um, who were in the carols that um, sounds like Val will be and team will be starting to uh, pull out of this space today, but thinking creativity not only exists in the individual, but it exists in the team. And, and creativity is a normally distributed trait that can be developed in all people, um, not just uh, the geniuses um, that have um, really shifted our own fields. So um, then we started to really see where were the hot spots. We wanted to know um, what spaces, where were the hot spots within the spaces? Where did there seem to be um, more demand than 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 you know seating? Um, where where were areas? And likewise, where were areas that were underutilized? So um, as Adrian led uh, Adrian Del Monte uh, led the charge on the, ma the behavior mapping portion of this study. So uh, looking also at the time periods, we wanted uh, we had data that showed when the library was most in use. So that um, uh, time period was analyzed as well as a, a lower use period. And then from that, we developed profiles of those user types. So it would be an individual working in a carol or an individual working in a space designed for teams and spreading out. Or And we started um, when we almost had the, the time lapse of all of these floor plan images, you could start to see um, it was very interesting how this how the space um, was moved over over the time period which we collected data. Also central to our study design, and I know it's important um, for this group. It's questions have bubbled up um, in in our previous two workshops. How important it is not to make. Um, assumptions about the end users. Um, we know their individual differences, um, but also um, undergraduates and graduates, as well as um, the staff who worked in this space all had very useful insights and had some specific needs. And that was critical to go through. Um, so the survey gave us a broad swath of responses, and we had um, over 300 respondents, and we were pleased with that. We did offer, uh, we incentivized this. I think we had a coffee card um, as an incentive for participating, you know, in in the surveys, and then the focus groups allowed us to start, you know really delving into some of those findings. So we got a feeling of um, uh, more nuanced res responses to some of the broad um, data that, that bubbled up from the surveys. And then um, as Val had pointed out, those three samples of slides you saw, the students 
really did work with the data from this study. So it would be evidence-based design as opposed to taking more of an intuitive approach to design. So the students were actually evaluated, graded, they were held accountable in midpoint reviews um, by faculty and by other professionals um, in the department on actually meeting the criteria that were put forth um, by our research team. Okay, next slide, please. So again, um, as I alluded to, and all of you have 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 your own um, challenges and travails from COVID, some of the there was an impact um, on this study, and just let me share um, a few points of of impact. So essentially, um, having having uh, maintaining spatial distancing reduce the number of students that could be in the library it was it was at 34 percent capacity um maintaining a cd following cdc guidance maintaining health safety and welfare um really prompted you know the space to be shifted in, 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 in a way, you know, the plexiglass barriers started going up. There was an expectation for masking and, and social distancing. Um, in fact, our study, um, we needed to shift um, the data collection to the fall because there was a time period that spaces um, were, were fully closed. And our original idea was our original study design was to do an intercept interview uh, or you know intercept survey. So what would what this would mean would be students that were working in 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 these different spaces throughout the library. Our whole research team, I think we had about eight people um, fully engaged. We had several. Um, graduate students that were also involved at different levels, Adrian being the primary lead as he was finishing his doctorate. But um, you would go and, and, and talk to students. We would all have a standardized survey form, but they would be able to give impact on what was working in this space, what was, what was not, um, any suggestions. And we had developed an intercept survey so they could literally look around and in real time give us information. But that was not possible to do with um, maintaining good practices um, in a pandemic. So we did focus groups and you'll see later, um, Laura is going to show you, we did show them images of the library and they were able to pick, you know, these are areas I study in and then they were able to critique and provide feedback from those areas. Then there also was an app put in place where uh, students or anyone uh, could download an app. And for example, we are still using this. And I, and I think it's a great tool. I've personally heard back from students. It's kind of nice to see how many people are in the library and um, what percentage um, occupancy that you see. And this is something, um, that it seems like will be used in the foreseeable future. Students like it. It seems like uh, the powers that be in the library like it, and it it's um it it's been well used. Okay, next slide, please. So essentially, we had talked about this earlier, but we we're taking this holistic approach to um, wanting to elevate and create conditions that uh, are conducive to creative thinking, problem solving, both by students um, working individually, um, as well as, as when they're working with a partner or working in a small group. And again, um, we know that the pandemic really, um, the expectations for maintaining 
physical and psychological feelings of, of safety and protection were important. And what we know from Abraham Maslow and we know from the research is you have to have those base physiological and security um, needs satisfied for you to be able to move into higher level um, thinking and problem solving and, and, and creativity, which is, which is closer to the apex of Maslow's pyramid. So again, you, the point being is if you're cold or hungry, or you feel really unsafe in this space, there are too many people encroaching in your area, you're not going to be able to really think creatively. There's a cognitive dissonance. So we needed to make sure that that alignment was in place. And so again, as I have mentioned, um, our study was premised on the fact um, that we were going to look at creativity in the individual in group, and also that creativity spans a process. We'll, we'll take a quick look at the classic um, Wallace model that is still really in use with adaptations today. And we know that um, research um, shows that certain spaces can help um, create a sense of place and, and promote um, development and, and knowledge acquisition and application, and then create a, even a larger sense of belonging, which is important and, and really did, was reinforced with our focus group findings. So um, choice and control became important to this creative ecology that when you're looking at these different embedded spaces within the library, that um, if you're working for a long block of time, you know, maybe three or four hours or more, that you're able to satisfy those, those more base needs, the physiological needs. You, you have a sense, you have sight lines, you can, you can sort of see exits, people coming and going. You don't feel so isolated that you feel sort of vulnerable, like something could happen, you know, to you or, you could get up for a minute and your laptop would be gone. And, you know, that has to happen. You want that choice and, and control. There might be a certain part of the day that you're wanting to do more ideation and brainstorming. You want to be in a, in a soft chair near a window, looking out at outside at some of the, the pine and palm trees that we have throughout our campus. And other times you may want to be in, um, uh, environment that really limits the stimulation. Um, and at any rate, so choice and control really did have um, play a tremendous role in creating um, the environment and, and, and drivers for the student work um, and charrettes. Next slide. Okay, and we have seen this is uh, this is the work directed by uh, Dr. Del Monte, and over time, again, you start to to feel that flow of where the individuals are located, where the groups are working, and and then we're seeing individuals um, spreading out and working in group spaces. Okay, thanks, Meg. So to take that um, Adrian's um, space typology analysis further, um, we did a little bit of number crunching from the spaces and you know from the work that Adrian and his colleagues did. And so, you know, for me, you know, applying. <laughs> you know, looking at things from a more quantitative um, viewpoint, you know, just to see what, what else do we see here? You know, because we could observe, but how could we articulate what we were seeing? And so turning it into some numbers, um, again, you know, Adrian and his group looked at the space from three different activity types, 
individuals working, individuals working in groups, and then individual uh, groups with individuals working separately. And so, um, so we counted all of those um, dots and you know, these were the individual, this was the group the, in the blue. And so what we saw overall, just from a total um, count of all the different times that you know, there were um, eight observations per floor, so 30 for each um, you know, in January. And there were multiple different times, you know, on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and we derived those times from, you know, the high volume and the low volume periods of the libraries. And Wednesdays, you know, between one and two prior to COVID, um, traffic might be up to 2,000 people walking in and out of the library in one hour. And uh, it's a it's a really busy place, but in terms of occupancy, them coming in, sitting down and, and doing something, this is really what Adrian's work got at. So in terms of capacity usage, um, you know, I looked at the low and the high percentages of that space that was available. And so for each of the different floors, and so the low capacity usage for individual seating as an individual activity was under 7%, but the high was 178%. So how does that work? Well, that means that there were individuals actually working in group spaces. And so we saw that consistently in the basement um, where there's over 700 seats, but approximately, I would say, about 75% of them would be designated or, you know, as intended for group work, um, but that's not how they're used. So, you know, the nice thing is, is that students feel that there's a lot of flexibility. And so, um, you know, that was never really an issue um, in terms of capacity. Now the group capacity usage was, you know, for the space intended to be used by groups, was as low as 1% and as high as 102%. Well, how do we get that 102%? Obviously, students move things, and this 102% happened on the second floor, which is the entry level for Marston, and there's the fewest number of seats on that floor. I think it's 236 is what we had counted. So, you know, on Wednesday um, in the afternoon, that's definitely going to be a really busy time, especially for that floor because it's the high traffic area. So then um, to look at those who are working in a group, you know, in a group, but working individually, that's where these high numbers are coming from, where it seems like it's not possible to have 178% <laughs> individual capacity, but that's exactly what was happening is that these represented a lot of those people who they come in together, you know, the behavior mapping is students coming in as a group to study together, but they're not really studying, you know, one focused topic, they're just there together studying. So we also looked at the highest total occupancy by floor. So at this time, these are, um, 736 is the total seating capacity on the basement first floor. And then again, two is the entry floor. So it's 282 seats. And so obviously the occupancy is the highest on a floor that has fewer seats and it's the most accessible in terms of that's where they have to go through that floor. So, um, but then you can see the floor with the lowest um, total occupancy, and we're going to kind of follow through on this, you know, we're seeing things already. There's the anecdotal information that, you know, the librarians and the team brought to the study, and then you have this space analysis, which, you know, really started to confirm things. You know, students aren't just using the space as it was intended, um, and they're, you know, appreciating some of the flexibility of the space that they find in, you know, the first and second level 
um, have been renovated and, um, you know, and so they have more flexibility to use those spaces as they would like. Um, so then the question is, you know, and please feel free to, you know, I think um, there was a comment earlier by Kimberly, you know, about doing a space, a space typology analysis. What don't you know about your space that a spatial analysis would help you better understand? And so Kimberly, can you share what you were looking to find out about your space um, through doing a, a space analysis? Sure, um, I think that there were a few things, but um, one would be how many people were sitting individually or in a group because uh, for example, on our ground floor, we had a lot of long tables with um, chairs close together. And then it seemed like we saw people, um, you know, sitting at a table and then five chairs would be unoccupied. So um, places where we anticipated groups sitting, um, they may not be. And then also like, what was the size of the groups? So how much group seating uh, did we need to have? Okay, great. So we all want to hear back from you after you do some of your observations. <laughs> Is there anyone else who wants to share things that they think that this would benefit them and what that question might be that you'd answer with a study like this? Laura, this is Meg. Can you, maybe everyone in the group does, does know one another, but what institution is Kimberly affiliated with? I'm so sorry that I didn't say that. Um, I'm at Texas Tech University. Oh, okay, great. Yes, and I have some, some of my colleagues on the call too. Thank you. Thank oh, you. excellent. Well, welcome to Texas Tech. So feel free at any point though, as we go through, you know, if you have ideas or questions that you'd like to answer from the space studies, um, feel free to put them in the chat as well. So, um, so this, you know, this is just quantifying some of the things that we see, but it's a way of looking at what's going on on the floor. And so I think one of the strengths of this study is, you know, Meg showed you earlier was, you know, the different ways that we were collecting information and confirming information and kind of interrupting our own um, ideas of what, the study should be and what students were doing in the space. So um, as we mentioned, you know, we had to change up the survey and it turned from an intercept survey into an online survey. And frankly, you know, I've done an online survey before and granted it was about um, overnight library hours, which is, you know, just a raving topic for students on the UF campus. They are very um, possessive of the library's time overnight, but, um, and they, you know, they have a strong opinion, but, you know, so we, we actually got 608 responses for the survey, um, but we only analyzed 337 of them because they had to have visited the library and they had to finish the survey. So those are the ones that we analyzed. And so to help, this um, survey be a little bit more, you know, to give them prompts where, you know, some of these people may have visited the library previously, but in the fall of 2020, a lot of students were not coming to campus. And so, um, so we put in photos of each of the floors. So they had to select the floor that they typically use and then they would skip to the next set of questions. And the first one would ask them, you know, what, um, what characteristics of the floor, you know, um, do you like? And so, or how do they make you feel? And so we repeated, if they said basement, then we repeated this image in that question so that they were getting prompts about the space that they're talking about in lieu of being actually in the space um, and us 
you know, interrupting what they came to do by asking some questions. So this was one way that we adapted our survey. So then, um, you know, to really get in deep to how we analyzed the survey where um, Val says, I'm getting in the weeds. She's letting me get in the weeds today. So, um, but I'm not gonna, you know, go into a lot of detail about the results, you know, pretty soon we'll have our report out, but I'm going to talk about the different um, ways that we looked at the survey data, because as we developed the survey, you know, we had the adjective checklist, and then we also had other questions that covered some basic descriptive um, behaviors of the students. And then um, we had a lot of open text questions. And as we were putting them together and Jason was creating questions that were open-ended, I was like, oh, these are gonna be a bear to analyze. And so Adrian and I did analyze a lot of the comments, but it really um, enriched what we learned about student feelings about the space. So the survey, um, we did the statistical analyses that we did, you know, we did basic descriptive statistics. We did a means comparison. We did a related sample sign test. And then we used the reliability scale to see, you know, is this testing what we think it's testing? And as we went through, what I started to see in the data was that creativity, you know, based on the model that we were using, creativity is the path to innovation and problem solving. So what we were lo really looking at was, what is it about the spaces, if there is something that facilitates the creative process that leads to these outcomes of innovation and productivity? So to make something that meets the, you know, the goal of this research library impact framework, we did statistical analysis, and then we did qualitative coding of um, a lot of the comments that we got using the space typology, which I'll show you, and the space use concepts, and system-wide diversity, which um, I'll show you that, and it actually comes through in a lot of the comments that we received. And then we looked at the focus groups and also used our typology to, to look at them um, and to gain additional perspectives and building really on the work that um, Temple did that Nancy presented at the beginning of the, um, of the studies was you know, to make sure that we were gathering our employees viewpoints in the focus group. So we did have a, an employee focus group um, because employees have different perspectives and they're also valid because they're seeing things every day and they're seeing different uses every day. And so this all seemed really important to collect and go through. So for the descriptives, um, you know, we talked about some assumptions that we made. And um, one of the assumptions was, you know, we're going to renovate the fifth floor and that's going to be the graduate student floor because graduate students need a space all to themselves because they're seriously studying. <laughs> and then, um, you know, so as we started to look at the data, you know, we saw the things that they were doing at this time. And for this slide, what we felt like we were seeing, you know, where the individual study was really, really high. Um, what we felt is that, you know, this is definitely impacted by the COVID constraints that we had in place. Um, because you can see that, you know, use of team, you know, the space for team projects and group studies, um, we felt like, you know, was actually pretty low, you know, and the infrequent use was higher. And we did see, we did ask, you know, students how much they were being constrained by COVID and that was actually a pretty high frequency. So, um, so then as we thought about this grad space, um, we noticed that 
actually, you know, the graduate students were pretty heavily using the basement. And so in this section, you can see that actually, you know, the grad, you know, 35% of the grad students were using the basement level, which we consider to be kind of a commons area. If you go down there during, you know, some of these hours, it is a really busy place. I mean, it is packed. And so that was a surprising finding for us, but it did kind of start to lead us back to where a study that had been done at the library, um, maybe it's been five years now, by one of our team members, Sheila Bosch, that, you know, identified this concept of alone together, you know, that students want to be doing their individual study, but they don't want to be isolated. And so we started to say, okay, we need to look at this more. And then we also looked at the duration of their visits and the total hours per week that they were spending in the space. And what stood out to me is, you know, as you see, the undergraduates actually spending more time in the space. And, you know, is that because, you know, they don't have their own offices. They're, you know, as graduate students, some of them have office space if they're working as research assistants. But um, what we were a little bit surprised to see is how much undergraduate students reported spending in the space. So once we got through some of the descriptive statistics, um, we looked at our comparison of current versus ideal space. This is the adjective checklist. And so it's um, a paired differential where you have, you know, on the one side, so it's a one to five Likert scale. On the left are all the ones. So if it's more pleasant, then I would go, I would rate it something closer to one. If it's more unpleasant and down, I would rate it closer to five. So in looking at this, it's important to, first of all, recognize what's on the low end of the scale. It's not the case that the higher the mean means that that's a, you know, a more favorable outcome. But so we could see that currently it, you know, for pleasant, unpleasant, the current score was higher because unpleasant is on the five side, but an ideal score is lower and coming more onto the pleasant side. And so I ran um, a comparison of the mean statistically, and we could see that where there was big mean differences, um, uh, you know, this was interesting to see that, um, you know, they want it to be more arousing. Um, that's a big difference. And all of these were statistically significant with the exception of informal formal, there's just a small difference between current and ideal, okay? And then overwhelmingly crowded, uncrowded has a big difference. And that finding appeared when we looked at these by floor, that finding appeared on every single floor. This was the largest difference between current and ideal space. So that kind of shows you what kind of a busy place that Marston occupies, you know, it's right in the center of campus and it's right near a commons area outside that's very active all the time. Um, and so, um, so we could see that these were significant, but it didn't explain everything. So um, because they could choose you know, between current and ideal, it may be that for one student, you know, their ideal might be that they want a space to be not too calm, not too quiet, maybe a little bit, you know, noisy. And so we realized that we had to look at it differently. And plus, you know, this was not a normal distribution. So I had to use a non parametric test to kind of really look at how we had set up the adjective checklist and to see more of the movement um, from 
the numbers rather than just the total mean and the mean difference. So we looked at the current and ideal and looked at the difference between, um, for instance, on social, on the current, you know, you have basically the same numbers, a little bit higher under slight, slightly social. Um, and, you know, but if you look at the ideal space, there's movement out of the end into the middle categories. So that kind of speaks to the whole issue of choice and control and system-wide diversity. They don't just need it one way. And as you'll see, that kind of also speaks to the iterative nature of the creative path. And so, so in seeing these, you know, this kind of spoke to us more where, um, you know, sleepy and arousing, you know, those are seem to be opposites. Everyone's in the middle. But um, on this side, they're actually moving much more to arousing. And so by looking at this, we could see that we still needed a, a better statistical analysis to kind of understand what does this movement mean? So, so first I looked at um, the difference um, on the mid scores between the current and the ideal. And what we could see except for exciting and gloomy, which is an interesting one, uh, interesting pair, most of the movement was into uh, a higher percentage of two, three, and four. So they were moving into the middle. They don't just want it um, to be quiet they don't just want it to be noisy, they want it somewhere in the middle. Some ambient noise is, you know, of comfort to people. Um, and so to see that these were moving, you know, more into the middle rather than into the extremes, social, unsocial, what does that mean? It means that there have to be spaces that can be flexible, accommodate, um, and that they need both. And so, um, so we kind of looked at, you know, what does that mean further? So after realizing that <laughs> there were probably other tests out there, um, I just want to point out here that for me, you know, um, I'm not a statistics genius. Um, I work my way through it. And like most of you probably here, I, I think, you know, there are a few people in this room that are you know, really strong at statistics, but, you know, it's something I have to work at. If you only do it once a year or once every two years, you know, you're, you don't get as much practice. You're not as good at things. So I use other tools to help me through this. And, um, and so one of them is Laird Statistics, and it's a website that you can go to, and they walk you through you know, from the beginning of cleaning your data and testing it for reliability um, and normality. And so, you know, I would suggest that if you do get into some of these things, it's a great um, site to use. You can pay for a month, it's like $14.99. And in that month where you're doing, you know, statistical analysis, it will walk you through you know, how does your data have to be set up? What kind of tests can you run with that kind of data? You know, how do you interpret your results? And then how do you report your results? And so, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that I do rely on that because, you know, I, I wanna do the best job I can, but I don't wanna spend a lot, a lot of time, you know, being a statistical expert because that's not my interest. So in looking at this test though, we did the related sample sign test. And what it does is it looks at the movement of the scores. And so um, again, you know, everything on here is statistically significant in terms of the movement from current to ideal is statistically significant. So Again, this isn't a random sample, so there's that limitation as well, but 
um, you know, in looking at this, we could see energetic and calm and informal formal, which in the means comparison also was not statistically significant. So what does this mean? So what this showed us was, again, looking at um, the movement into negative, what that means is that for students from current to ideal, there was only a movement of 19 into the positive, which was the unpleasant side. Um, you would expect mostly for that pair that most of the movement would be negative because pleasant was on the one end of the Likert scale. The interesting thing is also the ties. And so these are the people who answer the same from current to ideal. And so um, where there are um, these non-significant ones, you know, there's not a lot of movement. Um, but where you can see, for instance, with social, unsocial, you know, this again had a lot of movement, but people moving in different directions. So again, we're thinking, okay, this means to us that it's not just one answer, that the nuance here counts. And this is one way for us to identify how that works. And so for social, unsocial, 85 people moved to the positive, which is the unsocial side. 124 moved toward the unsocial and 128 stayed the same. And so as we look at these, you know, the collaborative self-reliant, some people move toward being a more self-reliant space, having that sense of privacy, individual space, um, but a lot of people moved into an area where they want spaces that are collaborative or have the potential for collaboration. And again, 144 stayed where they were. So this was one way of looking at the data and kind of understanding what that movement we were seeing in the percentages meant. And then this is just another graph of that and it kind of shows you you know, how the differences are from um, the negative differences and the positive differences. And you have to keep in mind, where are my adjectives on this Likert scale? Because if, um, if you go back, you know, sleepy is one, exciting is one. So, you know, you kind of have to remember where those, um, numbers fall because we didn't just put what we perceive to be the preferred adjective on the right and the less preferred adjective on the left, we mixed them up. Okay, so finally to in pursuit of the scalable goal for this, you know, for the research library impact framework project, um, I looked at this as a reliability scale. And by removing, you know, some of the adjectives, what we came up with, this was the highest reliability. In other words, is this testing what we think it's testing? And, um, and so, you know, a 0 0.852 of a Kronbach alpha is actually a pretty good score. Um, that this scale is revealing to you what we think it's revealing to you. And how would you use that? You would wanna see, you know, in your own study, if you did a, a survey like this, you would wanna see where you're at in terms of this and, and it needs to be tested. We don't know, you know, there may be other places where this scale is much higher where this is for our ideal scores, where are we with our current scores and what areas do we need to improve according to the statistics um, to make sure, you know, to improve the space in terms of its facilitation of creativity. What we also found in the correlation is that there is a high correlation between um, the responses, so the more that people wanted to be collaborative, 
they also wanted to be social. And so um, that was kind of, you know, makes sense finding. So to bring all this back to how would you use this for yourselves, you know, in your space, and then, you know, kind of getting at what um, Meg was talking about earlier is that, you know, this kind of mirrors and the creative process kind of mirrors um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so in looking at some of those that didn't make the creativity index, um, these six adjectives down at the bottom, they they're expected to be there. They actually came out, um, you know, with the movement toward friendly from unfriendly, toward relaxing from distressing, toward pleasant from unpleasant. That's the movement that we saw because those mirror the cycle, the physiological and the safety needs of students in that space. And so, um, so in looking at it, it really was kind of interesting how it fit where some of these are not so clear cut. You know, they do like a calm space, but grad students didn't necessarily always want a calm space. Sometimes they needed the energy of students around them. Um, you know, being in a public and private space didn't always work for the, you know, the point in process that they may be working in. And so what I would say is that in, you know, there are a lot of other, so this is based on Yarnell's and Meg, you can jump in here if you, you know, want to about where we source the adjective checklist from. Um, there were a lot more adjectives, adjective pairs on that checklist. And when we first looked at it, I thought, oh my gosh, we can't have a survey that long. They'll never do it. Um, and especially if it was an intercept survey. So Jason Manili really worked on putting these together, but in adding adjectives, you know, this is how I would think might be, you know, a way to kind of say, well, if these adjectives, you know, contribute to creativity and that process, what process am I looking at? And what other adjective pairs would I want to test? And so, you know, in using this to kind of plug and play your own adjective pairs um, based on whatever process you might want to look at. So um, the last thing we did with the survey is we coded all of the um, comments and Adrian and I spent a lot of time coding comments and trying to see, you know, what were they talking about in the comments? And this works into the space typology, the public, private, individual, and group um, combinations. And so system-wide diversity, we, you know, we looked at and we talked about it in terms of establishment, anti-establishment, and mixed. So those people who, you know, like a traditional library feel compared to some of the things they say they want in a library, you know, um, you know, lighting that changes as the day goes by or, you know, lots of technology. There's kind of a, a tension there between wanting a traditional space and, um, and then wanting something more modern. Um, and so, you know, so in terms of, you know, Kimberly, you mentioned and um, um, and Sarah, this might be something to consider is to, you know, how we were coding things. What were they talking about? What was their preference? You know, um, what were the things that were important to them? And then the space topics were to identify what were they talking about? We broke it out by undergrads and grads. And you know what were the things that they really um, focused on a lot, and how important was it to them? And so you know furnishings, obviously, you know there were a lot of comments about dated furniture or fixtures, and those are things we knew, you know. So, um, but what does this mean in terms of comments? And so 
for the system-wide diversity, you know, you have these comments. Um, I like the older style, you know, over the modern sleek style of the Library West, which Library West is our other um, humanities and social sciences branch. And it's, um, it's across the plaza, you know, the common area in um, on campus. Um, I think this is interesting because their perspective, you know, is that, and I don't remember which floor this came from, but their perspective is that Marston is more traditional than Library West. And um, it's just an interesting way to see what they're talking about, but they mention this, you know, the older style. Um, but then you have, this is what they want. So system-wide diversity gets at the fact that they really kind of want to see both things. You know, they talk about, um, you know, some of these even had mentions to Harry Potter because that's where they've seen, you know, a grand old reading room. Um, but then they want to have areas that have technology, a modern look to it, you know, a feel of being, you know, more contemporary. And so this is, you know, these are the types of comments. And this is why we came up with the system-wide diversity. Um, and, and it's a concept that Jason had mentioned during, you know, his talk about interior design concepts. And so it's just one example of, we were seeing that in our data. Um, we anticipated it, but, you know, they basically want to have their cake and eat it too. So from the intercept survey, these are just a few more of the um, comments that we had. And we had, you know, over a thousand comments that we went through and we coded and, um, you know, it kind of gets at, you know, the first comment gets at the fact that, you know, students don't mind having noise in the space. And in fact, they kind of want some of that, you know, to be a part of the space. And then they want to have safety. They want to be able to see what's going on in the space and have a view so that, um, you know, like it says, they feel too exposed. And then, um, the study spaces with, you know, privacy, but visibility. Um, and again, that, you know, gets at the safety of their feeling in the space. Um, okay, so, um, so we were fortunate to have Syracuse and Stephanie, um, I'm gonna ask you to chime in as you want. Um, to scale the survey, you know, and to test the instrument with other um, contexts, Syracuse took the survey and they developed their own instrument. And um, so I, I identified basically the aspects, you know, when I do a survey, I try and be very rigid about it, <laughs> but, you know, to identify the concepts that we're testing and the demographic details we're picking up. And so in looking at the two different surveys, um, you know, we focused on just, you know, some very, um, very, very few items. And, you know, in an attempt to increase our response rate to make sure that we only had, you know, so many concepts in here. And I think we, you know, we did well with that. Um, and we approached this survey using the word feeling. How do you, how does this space make you feel? Um, when you look at the Syracuse survey, they um, use the words adequate. And, you know, is it adequate for these, um, for your ability to engage in this community? And so their context was, um, you know, their learning communities. There's three different types of learning communities. And we were just looking at what's the floor they most typically use. So ours weren't, um, you know, um, tied to a community. So they were really ambitious in what they were trying to get at, you know, awareness of the communities, um, the activities they were engaged in, which we also looked at um, frequency of use for certain tasks, um, 
preferred improvements. Um, and then they looked at frequency of engagement with library workers, frequency of use of the library resources, and then the perceptions of the library staff. And um, we had some filters in there. Um, they have one filter that I could see. Um, and then obviously you can filter and you know do what you want in terms of analysis. And so their open text questions included descriptors, you know, what are, you know, um, descriptors of innovation, creativity, and problem solving, how the learning community helps students with academics, and how the library contributes to that success. And so Stephanie, please do chime in, you know, if you want to, if I badly yeah. bashed your survey or. <laughs> no, no, that's good, yeah. You're, you're right, we were very ambitious. And so, um, and this is something we'll, we'll talk about in our, in our short talk that we give with all the others, but we probably could have um, made our survey a little more narrow, a little less <laughs> comprehensive, and that would have made the analysis a little easier on us. But something yeah. that, that came to mind when you were talking, when we've talked before, is that in our, in looking at the comments, especially, um, the results from our survey, we found that, you know, we called it, we didn't call it choice and control, but we found that students and the directors of the communities really valued flexibility. So that I felt like was a concept that we had both identified and it was, it definitely came through in our survey as well. So. That's great. That's interesting to hear. And, and I think that we both felt like our surveys were constrained by COVID um, I think yes. for Stephanie, your your students weren't even on campus at the time, and our students right. were able to come to campus, but the libraries were definitely restricted quite a bit. Yeah, and we we had fewer responses than we would have liked too. So that also, you know, influences how you look at the survey results. Sure. Um, response rate always the challenge. <laughs> Okay, so for anyone else, what questions would you want to ask of your library space? Um, you know, we asked about their feelings about the space, the frequency of use, um, the duration of their visits, and how they felt about the COVID-19 constraints. And, you know, we felt like we needed to put that in there because you know, masking and the whole thing was really, you know, at times a reality we had to deal with as well. And I'm sure everyone in here experienced that in their libraries, you know. Um, but is there anyone out there who could see what questions you would want to ask of your library users that might be different from the ones that Syracuse and UF asked? Um, so, um, Sarah, you mentioned that you guys are looking at a pre and post renovation. Are you using the same concepts for um, both the pre and the post? Probably. Um, that's something that this summer I am, we're going to do the, the pre kind of assessment study, uh, fall, spring. Some of the renovation, if we get a grant, is supposed to happen next summer, and then probably then a kind of follow up um, post assessment using the same concepts. But um, I think, in addition to how are they using the space, how do they feel? Um, I also want to do a study looking at space from a DEI perspective um, and look at sense of belonging as also um, another another way of looking at our spaces as well. So yeah, several big studies coming up in the next couple of years. <laughs> That's great. Um, can you tell everyone where you're located? Oh, Texas Tech. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I can just suggest, you know, to look at the Duke study of their mm -hmm. library spaces that, and you yeah, probably have. That's yeah. the one that gave me the idea for the sense of belonging. It was one when I gave my job talk here that 
I actually included in my job talk because my job talk was on spaces. Um, so <laughs> yeah, no, and I've my dissertation was on spaces. So um, I've looked at spaces in several different ways and just trying to think about it in different ways now to to grow my uh, grow my uh, my research agenda. So yeah, <clears throat> excellent. Okay. You, what do you think may relate to that sense of belonging? Um, I think a lot of the the things that you've talked about the um, the top, the topology that you that you mentioned mm -hmm. the the private the um, the a safety I think is a big one mm -hmm. um, especially if we're looking uh, like Duke did from a DEI perspective mm -hmm. uh, do they feel safe and secure um, do they feel welcomed? Uh, mm -hmm. Do they feel, um, you know, looking at things that we have in our spaces like security gates at our entrances? Is that a deterrent to students um, from minority backgrounds? Um, is that something that makes them feel uncomfortable? Um, but also security walkthroughs, you know, something that we're trying to ramp up is doing more walk staff doing more walkthroughs and um, but how does that also affect students from uh, marginalized backgrounds as well like just um, one thing that um, you know I found in some of my previous research was this sense of what Agati calls haven what I called um, seclusion in my research that kind of like feeling kind of that your back is protected um, in, you know, does um, looking at traditional study carols and how does how do the how does that help with that sense of belonging and um, and safety as well? That do they feel that somebody's going to walk up behind them, or do they want different types of seating as well? So mm -hmm. just um, yeah, still trying to flush it out. It's something that's very kind of a new idea for me in the last uh, nine months, but um, still trying to flush that out. But then also this this renovation, which is just so massive because our furniture is you know primarily from the 1960s. It's it's time for a refresh, and just like like you all did at UF, it is time for a refresh, and so. <laughs> We, um, we have a grant that we're waiting to hear back on for uh, renovating our ground floor. Um, and then we need to renovate pretty much the other uh, six floors in the building. So um, it just, there's a lot that um, I wanna look at from different perspectives and look at space in different ways than what tech has looked at in the past and what's look at it differently than what's in the literature too. It's a big project, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, it is. And it's just, it's one that, um, you know, working with Kimberly and others here in the library that, um, you know, it's not, it's not just me. It's going to be, we're going to have to include others in, in the project as well, which is exciting. Like, I'm, I'm yeah. glad to have, to be at a place where we have those resources and the like encouragement to do this kind of work. That's good. Good. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap up this section just by reiterating, you know, the path that we took where we started was, you know, basically the creative process and the creative ecology, choice and control, and then working through the space typology. And, you know, in the first column is, you know, that path that students take as they go through the creative process you know, it's iterative, it's messy, there's nothing really, you know, that says that some of this can't happen in different areas or, or in different ways for different people. But what we found is that this is the space typology that matched that point in time for students. And then the creative ecology and the choice and control was really important in, you know, articulating what does this mean you know um, what it means is you know that they have access to resources authoritative sources um, individual and private space and facilitated group input for their preparation and so to kind of work through the process 
is kind of like, you know, if you're working through a research process, we went through this as, um, as a team also, you know, I could see the different areas, you know, the times where we were preparing, where we were really just kind of mulling things and we kept sending things back and forth. And when I thought we had an instrument and then we changed it again. And, um, <laughs> you know, those were, we could see that in this process for ourselves. So um, now we're going to move on to Val and we're going to talk about where this landed us and where we're at today. Yeah, so this will be really brief because we, you know, I think our findings are our findings, but I think if you can see what, um, how we approached our data, I think it can help you understand how we, um, how we made it actionable, right? So I wanna talk about the fourth floor specifically um, because the fourth floor really had the strongest differences in value between the current and the ideal of any of the floors, um, of the floor's data. Um, the responses indicated that the floor needed to be more arousing, more exciting, more social, more collaborative, more friendly, um, but less, less crowded. Um, but it also, we had respondents who also said that it needed to be uh, 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 more gloomy, 20% more gloomy, like 20% of respondents uh, wanted it to be more gloomy. Um, that doesn't actually mean they wanted it to be more gloomy, right? They just wanted it less exciting. Um, they didn't, you know, they didn't want to be distracted in their work. Um, and so what we could do is we could look at how our floor was currently arranged and, and then reevaluate how we presented our furniture and our space um, in a way that, that supported their needs. Um, I, I will also say that this, you know, this conversation about gloomy um, versus exciting really had us, we had a good conversation about whether we had the right adjective pairs right? Whether those two pairings were the right way to go about it. And I think in the end it was, um, even though gloomy isn't ideal, it's not, you know, it's not something that people choose as a, uh, as a, uh, a desirable trait. I think it, it did give us uh, the ability to evaluate the floor in a way that was helpful. Um, and so just really quickly, you know, what, how that led to our conversations. Laura already mentioned our grad only space. You know, we had, we came into this thinking, yes, we're gonna do a grad only space. This is obviously is something our Dean wanted. It was something that, um, uh, that we thought could be a good idea, but we, we shifted gears on that. We decided, no, we were not going to do a grad only space because students um, didn't want to study as grad only in, in one space. They really wanted to be more inclusive of their undergraduate of undergraduate students and then of course we had um we had an increase in biophilia a request to have uh increase in biophilia and this is plants but as um meg would very clearly articulate if she were the one presenting this this is really um an immersion into nature to get that physiological response right and and it can and it can include plants it can include artwork um, it can it can be more inclusive than just or or it can include aquariums, right? But it um, but it helps them feel more connected, uh, maybe to the natural world. Um, we had private seating and booths, and and I'll, I'll show you some images in the next slide on that. Um, we wanted to provide students with more space. We have got we we get so myopic on maintaining seat counts with our renovations. Um, that we got away from really having personal space respected, I think, with our students. And it rein this study reinforced for us that we need to prioritize that, especially with quiet study where um, personal space is very important to you. Um, and then the rest of the, you know, computers, improving sight lines, all, we've talked about these, uh, you know, in other sessions. Uh, uh, and, and also allowing for sp you know, space to spread out both for individuals, but for groups. And this is just the rendering of what our interior designers are putting together um, for one of our floors. And, and we like these little booths are things that we have 
community booths on some of our floors, but these little individual booths we expect will be very well received um, uh, for, for one of our renovations. Okay. So we're going to um, look really at what design you know, brings to the table and what lessons can be learned. And this work, again, trying to uh, differentiate it between you working specifically with um, a facilities planning, um, um, you know, arm of your institution. Um, some of you have that role if you may have um, interacted with those professionals. But I know, for example, at Texas Tech, they have a uh, accredited um, program, and there are 184 CETA accredited interior design programs, primarily concentrated in North America. And those accredited programs prepare um, students for entry-level work and sitting for licensing exams. And they can be located in three separate places, um, generally on campus, three academic homes. So at the University of Florida, we're affiliated with architecture. Our faculty in interiors also has a strong social science base we, um, and orientation. But at Texas Tech, for example, interior design is located in the human ecology um, building. Again, there's more of a social science space other accredited programs have more of an alliance or fall within the fine arts um, portion of the of um, the campus and the fine arts focused um, programs. And here in Florida, we have um, a number of accredited programs, but FSU, Florida State University, our um, counterpart in Tallahassee, has more of a residential typically fine arts programs have a bit more of a high-end residential um, focus um, to them. However, all accredited programs, the students are expected um, to be able to show mastery of research applied to um, design, um, design problem solving and design thinking. And similar to what we were talking about um, you know, just a few minutes ago in terms of diversity, equity, you know, inclusion, um, access is, is really um, allowing, when you, when you look at and analyze um, the, the interaction between, the, between people in space, you see uniquenesses and unique needs as well as ways to bridge commonalities and connections that really help provide a North Star for the design process. I think um, by having this collaboration with design, as Val just pointed out, um, it allowed us to really empirically show that um, going with grad only designations for this particular context was not going to achieve um, or optimize the outcome. And again, really helps support what the end user experience is. Um, further, again, we had talked about um, almost a cycle of um, pre-design, research, po post-occupancy assessment, and potentially at, at different levels of renovation, um, that process can occur to really gauge what that end user experiences and, and also to better support library staff, staff to optimize what, what they do within their workspace. And this can create a, a sense of place, a stronger sense of belonging. And really, we know the resources at universities can be hard to come by. You know, we're in a um, feast or famine often scenario. But having these relationships um, between the design departments and um, the library, you know, partners can allow you to make um, really 
evidence-based decisions that will serve you well in over time and uh, work with the students. So we have in part an approach where you have ideas that are being generated and really driven by students. So this design by students for students approach. And of course, um, there is the, the role of the licensed professional um, that's involved in terms of the design programs, faculty within the design programs, as well as the um, affiliated design firms who will be implementing the projects. And we have, our department has also worked with a number of architecture, interiors, and multidisciplinary design firms. Um, the other piece, which we, we haven't really talked about yet, is again, a picture is worth a thousand words. And when we're getting people to, to sort of visualize space and think about how it might be um, transformed in a sense to better serve, um, in this case, um, a creativity happening both for individuals and teams, having drawings, models, showing actual physical materials, samples, um, even three-dimensional modeling that can show how users would even move throughout the space and negotiate, um, move between different floors. This shows a wealth of possibilities to non-design audiences. It's extremely exciting. You know, you can have deans and other decision makers who might have an idea, you know, in their in their head, and and but it opens up kind of entrenched ideas to new ways of um, thinking about the library, and also we have seen it as a powerful tool for soliciting private donations. Um, when donors can see how a space could be transformed to be more welcoming for students, when when the, when that donor, when she knows that students have really been brought to the table in this process, it's pretty powerful. Next slide. So um, very quickly, because we do want at least a little bit of time for questions. This, and, and Jason and I talked about this many times, and so did Adrian and, and I, and this process, it just, none of us knew each other at the beginning um, of the collaboration, and over time, we had, we had about four other members who had great contributions and evolved, but, but then a core of us continued to march, you know, through the entire process, but it was truly a joy. I think because it was very much of a, of just a great meeting of the minds and there was an openness to full collaboration and contribution on, on both sides. We really felt grounded in this holistic approach that um, we weren't just looking at a particular floor, but we had to really look about a floor or a space in the full library context, the role that it plays and how it connects with the whole, as well as there was a real buy-in for an ecological approach to creativity in terms of um, embedded environments, which impact one another. So really um, there was also a commitment that the research, the value of the research had to go beyond I like it or I don't like it or a preference um, for a certain color uh, palette or um, furniture offerings, but really wanted to, to get, a, get deeper. Um, thinking about um, going beyond what, what is here currently to what could be. And, and there were multiple ideas on how we could transform the library and the shred examples that we showed you in our last workshop really showed that. Um, we were able to question assumptions. Our research design also echoed this participatory process that did recognize the value of um, different 
stakeholders um, of students and staff. And that, and that was important and that reflected the values of the team. On the design team, nothing is better than to work with a real client. And um, the University of Florida campus, like all of your campuses, offers a, a living laboratory to do this work you know, in. Um, and the possibility that the work would be implemented and we could have um, influence on that is just incredibly rewarding at every level. Um, again, when you recognize individuals and teams and then really, I think we would really love to continue to work further in terms of the inclusion, diversity, equity, and access space, that's so important. And you may have noticed um, how the students compared to um, some of our, our colleagues and friends in architecture, when you're seeing a lot of their models of spaces, the entourage often does not include, there's not as much emphasis on people in space. We're looking at a larger scale. Um, and that's not always true, but I think within the um, interiors, we're really starting to imagine sort of people in space. So I will pass um, the floor. Valerie is is your is passed to you. Thank you. Well, so this is you know our project team. We've uh, we've been here and you've seen our faces. Um, really, and I want to say thank you to. To that team because they have been fabulous to work with. Um, Sarah Gonzalez and Jean Bossart from the libraries have also been participating, um, and and so and Sheila Bosch. Really, I just want to take a moment and thank um, ARL and Sue because this has been an incredible opportunity for us um, to explore research and, and a collaboration that we wouldn't we wouldn't have done otherwise and I think it has done wonders for um, for our library spaces um, to have this research behind our renovation and so the the ARL team has been fabulous to work with I have enjoyed hearing the projects coming out of the other universities um, and so I think we'll just close out with that and um, hand it off to Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Thank, and thank you for those very kind words. It, it, I too have enjoyed working with, with you and the, the rest of the University of Florida team, and, and especially you and Laura, uh, who've been leading this and, and all of the other teams. So we are looking forward to a, a celebration in a few weeks with all of the other teams. I just want to say thank you once again to you know, for this workshop series. It's been absolutely amazing. And I said last at the last session, I wish I was back in a library so I could participate in something like this because it is just wonderful the work that you that you have done. Uh, and I hint, I hope you the University of Florida team will continue to share and um, your research and the work that you're doing. Um, I think would be beneficial to all of us as it already has been. So thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for attending. It's really great to, to see you and, and thank you for coming to all of the workshops. And I, I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.